Welcome to Great Points, financial insights for improving your relationship with money. I'm Matt Schroeder, Certified Financial Planner and Director of Financial Planning at Great Point Wealth Advisors, a fee-only registered investment advisory firm with offices in Boston and Danvers, Massachusetts. Today, I'm joined uh, by a friend of mine and a wonderful guest, Mike Stair. Uh, Mike, do you want to introduce yourself for a little bit? Yeah, Matt, it's great to be here. Uh, my name is Mike Stair. I am a physical therapist, a personal trainer, and a nutritionist. I have a physical therapy practice here in Beverly, or down the road, I should say, in Beverly, and also a fitness practice, uh, Spectrum Fitness uh, Consulting. Uh, I have three daughters. I live up in New Hampshire, and they keep me quite busy. And uh, yeah, we help people with injuries. We help people who are trying to stay fit. We try help people who are trying to lose weight and uh, apply our unique approach to help them. Awesome. Yeah, so the reason I asked Mike to join us today is, you know, we talk a lot about personal finance. We talk a lot about a lot of different topics. Uh, and, it, and the idea of longevity has been coming up quite a bit in discussions with clients and with various colleagues. Uh, so I think, you know, as we look at the, the demographics, the odds are a lot of people are going to be living longer. Um, and for some people, that's exciting. They want to live as long as possible. For others, when I, when I say, hey, well, you might make it till 95 or 100, they're like, Ugh, you know, put me, put me out of my misery. I don't want to make it that long. Uh, and I think a lot of people uh, attribute the later years of life with not being high quality years of life. Um, so today we want to talk a little bit about longevity, but also not just living longer, but how to live better. And you know, I've talked to Mike quite a bit uh, over the last few years about the ideas of staying active longer. Um, so we're going to talk about you know what what the future might look like, and then also how what are some tips, some tricks, some things you can be thinking about uh, to maybe de debunk some of the myths that are out there about aging. Um, so you know, Mike, I know you, you probably see uh, older clients all the time. Um, what do, what's what are their attitudes? You know, when when they think about living longer. Well, I think you hit on something that uh, I think is a great Abraham Lincoln quote. Instead of trying to adding years uh, to your life, adding life to your years. And researchers are looking into that concept. Uh, it's called, instead of increasing your lifespan, increasing your health span. So just as you said, a lot of people do have this attitude, this notion that as you get older, inevitably you become less healthy, less fit, less functional, uh, a lot more aches and pains. And although to a certain degree that's true, uh, a lot of that is uh, preventable. A lot of that is at least to a degree modifiable. And uh, there is a lot of research in the last couple decades that has busted through a lot of myths about what we can expect as we get older, what we can do about that in terms of mitigating some of those inevitable declines of health and function. Um, so uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun seeing the evidence and more importantly, showing people what's actually possible as they get older. Yeah, and I, you know, just before this, I was looking up some statistics on kind of aging. And you know, if you look back to life expectancy, uh, in 2000, the average life expectancy in, in the world was 66.8 years. Uh, by 2019, the average life expectancy was 73.4. So, you know, some of that has to do with mortality. Some of that has to do with birth rates. But, you know, just in the last 20 years, we've increased our average lifespan by over five years. Um, and as we're talking about longevity, we're kind of talking into those 80s, those 90s, those, you know, hundreds. Uh, in, currently in the United States, there's about 90,000 people that are age 100 or older. Uh, 20 years ago, there was only about 45,000 of them. And the, the expectation is by 2050, there will be over 300,000 Americans that are over the age of 100. Right. Um, and so when you think about that, it's, well, okay, I, I don't necessarily know if I want to make it, but modern medicine and your family is probably going to try to keep you around for as many years as possible. So... Um, Let's talk about some of the things that, you know, you hear when people walk in and say, well, I'm getting older. Uh, you know, it's just it is what it is. I can't do anything about it. Um, you know, I guess what's the oldest client you you currently are working with or have worked with? Uh, currently, the oldest client I'm working with is 92. Uh, the oldest I've worked with is 98. Wow. So still doing personal training, still working out at age 98. Right. And, um, you know, as I mentioned, I do both physical therapy and uh, personal training. You would think that both those older uh, you know, people that I just mentioned were because they had an injury, they had a fall, they had some type of uh, incident. Uh, both of those were fitness clients. Wow. Okay. So, you know, we talked to, uh, behind, off the scenes about some of the common myths. So I'm going to I'm going to kind of talk about one, and then you're going to tell me kind of how we debunk that. Yeah, um, great. You know, the first one is you're getting older. I shouldn't be putting as much wear and tear on my joints. I, 
I want to make sure they last as long as possible. Uh, and so people maybe stop going to the gym, they stop lifting, they stop doing the things. But um, is that true? It is absolutely not true. Uh, we have a lot of evidence now. It was conjecture in you know maybe 20, 30 years ago. Now we have hard data. Uh, you look at people who perhaps in their 40s had knee arthritis that decided to start on a running program. Fast forward 10, 20 years later, they have no greater incidence of arthritis. In fact, completely contrary to what you think, they have less incidence of arthritis compared to the non-running population. Going into those extremes, looking at people who do the most type of impact, the most type of what you would consider to be a wear and tear activity, uh, marathon runners do not have a greater incidence of arthritis, even as they go into the later decades, the 60s to 70s. Um, so we don't see that trend. Uh, in uh, populations I used to work with, which were spinal cord injury patients, amputees, they found that you would think that their shoulders are being worked more because they're using a wheelchair, or on the non-amputated side, uh, that joint would wear out quicker. We find that that doesn't happen. And the best analogy I could think of is if you told an older adult they should stop reading as much, they should stop socializing, they should stop playing chess uh, because it's going to wear out their brain, most everybody would laugh at those, mm -hmm. and that's ridiculous. It's the same logic about joints and muscles and tendons. Most of the things we tend to think are associated with aging. Um, are actually less activity, less stress on the joints can cause them to degrade. So while there are, are certainly extreme ex you know, exceptions to that scenario, in general, when we strain and stress joints, uh, they do not wear out prematurely. Um, they, in fact, can keep uh, very, very high level functioning, uh, even going on into the, uh, the 80s and beyond. So I'm getting a little older. Everything uh, starts to hurt. It seems like you know, I'm only 47 and everything hurts already. Um, so I shouldn't stop doing things. So if, let's say I'm in my 60s, my knee's starting to bug me a little bit, you know, because I've been running for the last 30 or 40 years. What yeah. do you tell that person? So what we uh, f tend to find that works better in those cases is um, when it's very acute. So you had no knee pain, and then all of a sudden you wake up the next day. Is what we call relative rest. Don't shut it down and don't do anything. Conversely, if you do the same thing that's irritating it, it's probably not going to get better. Um, it would be very similar to a child that might be struggling for whatever reason in math. We don't just say, stay home, we're not going to do any numbers. <laughs> Conversely, we don't over inundate them with actuarial science and you know calculus. You find the right level according to that ability, and you gradually increase it. Um, in cases of aches and wear and tear, you know, type of, you know, uh, people attribute to wear and tear, the reality is, is that for whatever reason, they may have exceeded the body's current capacity to recover. Uh, one of the ways that you improve their capacities is, again, the Goldilocks zone. Don't overload it. Don't underload it. And many people's unfortunate reaction is to underload it. And that really can, uh, uh, can not only uh, not help the problem, it can actually make things worse. And I think that kind of gets to one of the second ones we were talking about, that as you get older, you know, it's just a tendency, I'm going to gain weight, I, I'm going to lose muscle, my bones are going to get weaker. Um, you know, and maybe that's kind of, you know, people, things are hurting, so I'm not doing as much exercise. Um, so as you get older, do you have to get weaker? Absolutely not. In the extremes, of course, you'll see somebody who might have been bench pressing 300 pounds at 40 years old. It's going to be very difficult for them to keep that up at 80 years old. <laughs> uh, it has happened, um, but that's a relative exception. That being said, uh, you can still keep strength levels quite high. Um, you can still maintain bone density to a certain extent, but muscular strength can actually remain quite high. Uh, they've had a lot of studies that have validated from 40 years old to 80 years old. As long as you're appropriately loading the tendon and the muscle, that is the number one thing. So while you might see some changes in your maximum strength uh, over decades of time, those changes can be relatively small provided you're doing the right thing. And we have now, fortunately, decades of evidence to prove and show cases in which that's actually happened. Is there an age? So let's say you've you've never been a lifter, or you know you've you've gone you've done your walks, you've ran your five Ks occasionally, you you know play with the grandkids that type of stuff, but you've never done any physical muscle training or, or weight training. Mm -hmm. uh, is it ever too late? Absolutely not. In fact, the case studies that we have that have shown the most dramatic improvements have been in people who have been relatively sedentary or have never done any resistance training, and they started for the very first time 
into their late 80s, even their 90s. Um, I can tell you two really interesting uh, examples. One is a personal example, and one is a, uh, a, a study. Uh, one is a gentleman who had never done any weight training um, since he was in his 30s, and even then it was mostly uh, body weight things, push-ups, you know, squats, just from being an active younger person. Goes 60 years, uh, really being real, mostly sedentary. Started weight training in his late 80s. Um, by his 90s, he was able to do seven military-style push-ups off the floor. The last time he did that, he was 30 years old. Uh, was able to squat holding on to 55 pounds. Um, and this was somebody that was on the doorsteps, literally, of having to go into an assisted living facility. Is what kept him being able to live independently, um, enjoy life. Um, another is a study I quote when I do my presentations quite a bit, where the uh, youngest person in the study was 92 years old. Half of the people, the oldest was 104. Half of the people um, were split into a do what you normally do, and the other half did a resistance training program. Every single person in the resistance training program gained strength, reduced risk of falls, uh, and improved balance. Every single person who wasn't in that group re uh, uh, reduced their, or increased the risk of falls, reduced strength. Um, so they saw a decrease. Uh, so there doesn't seem to be an age where we don't see improvements as a potential, um, even if you start late into your 80s. And I know we talk about, you know, well, why, you know, I'm not looking to join the Olympics at 75, 80 right. years old. But, you know, I, I think you, you hit on some good points you know, when we talk offline about, you know, you've got grandkids. They, they gain weight each year. <laughs> so if you want to continue yeah. to be active with them and, you know, or getting on and up off the ground or just some of the things you're doing in daily life, you know, where, how can that, you know, living a better quality life longer, how can, you know, adding a little strength training even in your 70s and 80s make a difference? It, it makes a huge difference. I mean, if you think about it, you know, as a 200 pound person, if I'm trying to go up and down a step, I need to lift 200 pounds all on one leg. If that is at the peak of my capacities, stairs are gonna be a very ominous activity for me. They're gonna be something that if I have something to carry up the stairs, it's gonna be not only uh, something I don't want to do or difficult to do, it's also gonna be risky. So if you have a strength capacity that is double that, going up and down stairs is, is easy, it's safe, and it opens up your world to be able to travel more, to be able to uh, maybe go to your grandkids' house where you have to babysit and have to go up and down the stairs. Uh, what we want to do is we want to make people's capacities uh, to be far beyond what's needed for the day-to-day. -day. If their capacities are low, then their day-to-day -day capacity uh, tasks that they have to do, like lifting a grandchild, carrying groceries up and down the steps, it's going to severely not only limit them, but to put them at risk. And obviously, you know, as you age, uh, knee replacements, hip replacements, um, yeah. you know, those are becoming more common, more part of life, you know, for sometimes right. the things that are not just, you know, things do break down. Um, <laughs> Hold on, I'm going to take a quick commercial break. <laughs> it was a musical. Sorry guess. about that. I had muted that, but I actually turned it on. I thought I had muted it. Um, so let's talk a little bit about knee replacements or hip yeah. replacements. Um, knowing they they might happen. Right. What can people do to you know? not have them be a catastrophic change to their life? Well, the first thing I want to uh, bring in is that let's say you are thinking about a knee replacement. Your knees are really uh, not functioning quite well, and you're on the cusp of thinking maybe it's time to get this replaced. Um, it's a great surgery. About 80% of people are very satisfied and get great outcomes, and about 20% don't. And I believe one of the biggest differences is uh, what your health is going into the procedure. Um, there was two recent studies that looked at people who were eligible for total knee, and they all went through a three-month uh, prior uh, uh, to surgery strengthening program. Two-thirds of the people decided to opt out and not have the surgery. Um, another study showed similar type of things. So I think the point being is that first, not always assuming that because you have bone-on-bone -bone arthritis or severe arthritis that a knee replacement is always necessary. Always do a strengthening program first. Two things will happen when you do that. Number one, you'll have 
um, a potential of not needing to have it. The second thing is that if you do end up having the surgery, you'll have a better outcome with less risk. Um, but even if you've had that, um, you've went through the procedure, it became a success, it resolved your knee pain, you could do a lot of your day-to-day -day things. The patients that I work with that continue their strength training, not just in three or six months after the surgery, but for years, inevitably, they have less risk of falls, they have better bone density, uh, they are able to maintain their body weight you know, well because they're able to exercise a lot more. Um, so in short, do not let a knee replacement be a uh, hindrance to exercise. In fact, make that an absolute need to exercise. Keep that joint strong. It'll also help your other joint, the one that might be, not be replaced, to reduce its risk of having um, pain and, and a need for surgery. Yeah, I know a common friend of ours who recently had a knee replaced is, you know, knocking on the doorstep of getting back on the golf course. Cause, right, right. You know, he did the steps beforehand, and he, I know he's meticulous with his train, his follow-up training as well, so Absolutely. he's doing all the right things. Yeah. Um, you know, we talk a little bit about, you know, working out, and, you know, the, the general kind of myth is as I get older, I got to start just walking the mall, that's all I can do, or aqua aerobics or kind of, um, you know, low-stress stuff. Mm -hmm. um, is that you know, the fate of everyone who's getting older, is that the, and I think I already know the answer based on some of the things we've been talking about here, but, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, what, what would you tell someone who says, well, you know, that's, that's all I can do. That's all I really want to do. That's all I should do. One of the key things to keep in mind is that as you get older, your need to improve your strength gets higher because inevitably what will happen as we get older, if we don't do anything, we will lose not only muscle strength, but we'll also lose bone strength. Um, interestingly enough, there is a strong correlation between strength and mortality, as well as even cognitive function. So um, what I would say is that the older you get, the more important it is that you do strength training. And what I mean by strength training, it's not walking, it's not riding a bike, it's not taking a Tai Chi class. The studies have proven that the best way to improve quality of life, like preventing falls, like uh, being able to go up and down stairs, getting on and off the floor, uh, and even fun things like playing pickleball. Um, strength training is the most effective. When you're young, it's good to be strong. The older you are, the more important it is that you are strong. So I would tell people that the most important thing to do, the older you get, do not settle for doing quote unquote gentle or um, you know less stress activities like only walking or water aerobics they will not help you reduce your risk of falls. Um, it would be akin to saying, I want to get uh, smarter in math and saying, okay, well, let's read Dr. Seuss. <laughs> it's good to read, but it's not going to improve your math capacity. Strength is unparalleled in its capacity to allow you to get on and off the floor, up and down the stairs, uh, play with your kids, reduce risk of falls, and improve bone density. Um, so I would put that as your top tier. Um, it can be done even if you have a back issue, even if you have knee problems. Um, just like uh, a child who might have a hard time with uh, reading, uh, maybe because they have dyslexia, we don't give up and say, well, we're not going to read. We find unique ways to do it. So the principle is still there. We just might be a little bit more creative about how we do it. And can you talk a little about that? Because, you know, people think strength training. It's like, well, I've got to go put, you know, 200 pounds on the squat rack or bench right. press. Someone who's, you know, just getting into it, what, what are some examples of exercises you might have them do that would be their strength training, but it, once again, it's not, we're not bulking up here. Right, right. You know, strength training is uh, defined as your ability to produce uh, your, a maximum amount of force to do a specific task that you want to do. So strength training for somebody who is, let's say they're 70 years old, uh, they want to be able to keep up with grandkids, so they want to be able to travel independently. A strength training program for them would be focus on things like sit the stand, sit the stands off of a chair. Um, a lot of people call those squats, but it sounds scary that way. <laughs> um, or uh, going up and down steps, you know, taking one step, going up and down. It should be challenging enough that you can't do that more than about 10 to 12 times. If it's not intense enough, then it probably won't uh, facilitate strength. So it doesn't necessarily have to be on a machine. It doesn't have to be in a, uh, in a gym. Another example would be uh, a push-up. A lot of people think, well, push-ups are too hard. Well, if you do them off a counter, 
Um, if you're not particularly strong, that might be a, the proper place to start. In general, it's something that will challenge you so that you get fatigued within about 10 to 12 repetitions. So it doesn't have to have a barbell on your back. For some people, that would be strength training. Other people, it would be prohibitive to do. Um, I would say that those are three really good examples, though, of strength training that could be applicable to somebody who's younger. We would add more weight. Somebody who might be weaker, we would modify. So sit to stand off a chair, step up, or push up off your counter would be three really good examples. So if I can get it up, up and down out of my chair 10 or 12 times without losing my breath, I'm not really doing strength training. So I might hold the yellow, you know, I was going to say yellow pages, but I don't think they exist anymore. <laughs> uh, you know, hold a 10 pound weight or a 20 and just in increasing that. And when I get out of breath, then I'm realizing I'm probably building strength. Correct. And it might not even be out of breath. It might be that your, your muscles are tired. Sword, you know, yeah. um, I tell people that um, a fear of getting too strong is like a fear of having too much money. <laughs> it just doesn't happen. Uh, no one has ever regretted, boy, I really wish it was, you know, not so easy for me to be able to get off a low chair um, or a, a, a squishy couch or when a baby is asleep in my arms and I can't push up off the, you know, the, um, you know, the sides here. I have power enough to get off, you know, the ground from my legs. Um, so there really isn't a, um, a point where it, it's too much. Um, unless, of course, it's somebody's abilities. Um, just like calculus would be too much for a fifth grader, we have to gradually work up to that capacity. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's rare that we run into a scenario where somebody is upset that they've gotten too strong. Right, yeah. And if you have too much money, then you gotta pay more tax. So that's why I find a lot of people try not to have too much money. But, right, exactly. Um, so when you come to the financial side of all this, you know, uh, living longer means you need to have a little bit more money, which, which is you know, good for part of the planning. But also, you know, we talk a lot about kind of the quality of life and, you know, cancers, heart disease, obesity, these are things that are more and more common. People are living longer. They might be having more chance of running into various illnesses or diseases. Um, can you talk a little bit about how staying healthy, staying fit, whether it's running or lifting or whatever, how that kind of might help to mitigate some of those things or maybe push them off even further? There's some very good data, and it's very shocking when I present it to fellow healthcare professionals. Uh, the World Health Organization makes a recommendation about how much activity is sufficient to reduce the risk of disease and improve lifespan. And those recommendations are really simple. 150 minutes of continuous aerobic activity that's moderate or vigorous intensity per week and a minimum of two days of resistance training. So just to do the math, 150 minutes is in two hours and 30 minutes. A week. A week. Yes. And what most, most people forget is the importance of the strength part of that. So what they wanted to do is they wanted to see, obviously not everybody follows that. In mm -hmm. fact, only about 19% of the population does. They wanted to look at the people who only followed the strength training part, uh, part of this. The ones that did, they had a 23% lower risk of, uh, um, of cancer and a 34% lower risk of premature death. When they looked at people who followed the 150, there was a 12% lower risk of premature death, no difference in change of cancer rates. So what we have, we find that there's something unique about strength training that not only helps your bones, not only helps your muscles, not only helps your functions, but it also helps your immune system, it helps your cardiovascular system, and it helps longevity. The number one predictor in a group of 70-year-old men that were studied for 10 years, the one thing that predicted, the number one thing that predicted whether they lived until their 80s was strength. So strength is something that significantly mitigates your risk. When it comes to things like not only having cancer, but more importantly, surviving cancer. Fortunately, there's more and more treatments nowadays that has people surviving cancer. But one of the biggest problems for cancer survivors is that they atrophy, they lose a lot of strength and capacity. Those who are stronger have less risk of having deleterious effects, or they actually mitigate those risks to a certain extent um, when they have done a lot of strength training. So strength training is more than just getting your function, more than your muscles. It actually reduces your risk for a host of disease. And when and if you do have those diseases, unfortunately, the side effects of that, again, are significantly less with resistance training. 
And I know, uh, you know, you talk about atrophy. I know the YMCA in Beverly, and I think Danvers has as well. Like a, it's called the Live Strong program, but it's for people that have gone through cancer issues yep. and, you know, dealing with, you know, the challenges. If you've if you've had atrophy, you've kind of taken some steps back. Sometimes it yep. could be challenging or embarrassing, or you know, some you know psychological impacts of getting back in the gym. Right um, on. Right for on. anyone who's maybe never done it before and is embarrassed or nervous, or someone who had it and lost it. Any tips, suggestions, you know, how do you kind of coach people over that? Like, hey, it's not where you want to be, but we can we can get back. Right. I think one concept to keep in mind is what I call the BTN concept. Better than nothing. Hmm. The difference the YMCA uh, has a program called Live Strong, and mm-hmm. it's for individuals that have are gone through cancer and in remission and are trying to get back into shape or get back into the gym. And I know that they they focus on some of the issues of, you know, you know, insecurity and the challenges of just kind of getting back in, into the routine. Um, for someone who maybe is, you know, has gone through a, a challenge and maybe lost some strength or, or doesn't feel like they're at the same level or maybe someone who's never done it before, any tips or how do you coach somebody through that kind of the, maybe the emotional side, the psychological side? How do you get them, you know, excited about it again? Yeah, I would say there's a couple things that I would uh, I would tell somebody in that situation. Uh, number one is to warm them up to the BTN concept, better than nothing. Uh, the percent improvement you're going to notice from going from doing nothing to doing something is far greater than doing something to doing the ideal. So just getting started and just making taking the action is is something that will yield a lot of great benefits. It doesn't have to be the perfect amount. It doesn't have to be done perfectly. It doesn't even have to be done uh, at the at the perfect prescribed frequency. Just showing up, getting something done at that uh, structure at that juncture is a huge benefit. So I'd say that'd be the number one thing I tell them: show up and just doing something is a huge change. The other is that if you're there and there's other people that are in similar circumstance, or even those that aren't. Maybe there are people amongst your group that are very, very healthy and very fit. The culture, and I've been around gyms for 40 years, I can tell you that most people, 99% of people there are rooting for you. If somebody is there and they see you working hard or they see that you might be a novice, um, we're, as fitness uh, people, are, are excited for you. You know, it's a very... Uh, supportive uh, environment. Even the the ardent fitness fanatics um, get very, very excited when they see a novice. So don't think anyone's there judging you um, in any way other than uh, rooting for you. Um, and you might not realize that, ironically, by you showing up, you might be inspiring somebody else. Uh, so look at it as a way to pay it forward. Somebody else might be also afraid or scared or uh, a little bit self-conscious. By you showing up, you're helping that next person. Um, By you showing up, the people that are already there are rooting for you. And by you showing up and doing some exercise, even if you might not think it's uh, particularly impressive or it's not the ideal, it's better than nothing, and taking some action is going to be a huge, huge impact. And you hit on a good point. You know, people are pulling for you. Um, And I know we've talked a lot about accountability, whether it's to your money goals or life goals. Um, How how does the idea of accountability or, you know, working in a group or with a team or with a coach or whatever, you know, how does that factor into all this kind of staying healthier longer? Yeah, the accountability factor is probably the the most significant. And there's really uh, a few types of accountability. Uh, One is accountability to an expert. If you have an expert, a financial planner, a fitness coach, a therapist, they're expecting you to do certain behaviors and you feel uh, obliged to follow through with what the professional says. But there is a underappreciated part of accountability, and that's peer-to-peer accountability. Somebody in your group who also went through a knee replacement or somebody who is also struggling to lose weight or somebody who is uh, managing their their back issues but still going to the gym. Um, There is a really strong uh, group bond to that. You're trying to live up to... uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the standards that somebody else is, is set for themselves and vice versa. So I think there's a big part of that type of accountability. Um, another final thing I would say is that the evidence is really strong when people write out a goal and they have to show up to a coach. But another big thing, a mindset shift, is do not call your workouts workouts. Hmm. Call them appointments. Okay. People don't miss appointments. 
You know, when it's an appointment, there's somebody expecting them. If somebody says, hey, can we go out to lunch? You're like, no, I'm sorry, I got an appointment, but maybe later. People tend to regard that as more of a serious commitment. And if you think it's of funny, it that I way. skip workouts all the time to meet with my clients for appointments. So if it was also an appointment, I would probably slot them differently. <laughs> Re- reframing <laughs> as an appointment makes a huge, huge difference. So um, that's how I'd probably you know guide somebody on that, that accountability side of things. The other, uh, you know, sometimes you'll hear someone's like, oh, I'm going to get in shape. I'm going to go run a marathon. So go from zero to 60. That's it. And that's everything. Yeah. Uh, someone who's like, oh, I'm going to shock the system. I'm just going to get out there and do it. Good idea, bad idea, tips. As a physical therapist, it's a great way to get patients. Okay, uh, yeah. <laughs> but as someone who is uh, more concerned about general health, um, you know, although that can sometimes be great, have what we call inspirational goals, aspirational goals. You know, I want to be, you know, a bodybuilder. I want to run a marathon. Um, I think it's fine to have those goals, but I think what's more important is that you have process-based goals. So rather than say, I want to run the marathon, say, I need to uh, work out three days this week. You know, map out what the action is. That's a what we call process-based Not goal. work out, schedule three appointments. Yeah, good point. Yes. <laughs> Again, it's schedule three uh, fitness appointments for myself. Exactly. Um, I think that's a good way to maybe thread the needle because you don't want to demotivate somebody. If they're excited and they want to run a marathon, you know, well, okay. But in order to run a marathon, you got to start, you know, having an appointment for your, your workouts. Um, that's what I would tell them. Make a process-based goal, not just an outcome-based goal. Nice. Yeah. And I think as we talked a lot about this. Uh, we're going to make this a regular series. So once a quarter or so, we're going to get together and talk. And this one's been mostly about staying active physically. We'll talk more about nutrition and some of the other factors that go into kind of living longer, better. Um, but as we talk through, you know, from a financial planning perspective, a lot of times advisors will talk to clients about kind of three phases of retirement. And, you know, we usually start with the go-go phase, which is you are most active, still healthy, everything's working and great, and you're going to travel the world, and you're going to, you know, do all these amazing things that you've been pushing off for life. And from a financial standpoint, it tends to be your most expensive phase of life. And then, you know, they'll say, well, then you'll switch to slow-go, which is, you know, maybe we're traveling in the U.S. or visiting grandkids or but a lot of the bigger things are, are gone away. We're not as active. And then eventually you get to what's called the no-go stage, which is, you know, you know, at that point, maybe you're more uh, tied to your house or you're in your community. A lot of your time and, and time out is probably going to doctor's appointments. Um, as we think about these ideas, uh, ideally what we're trying to do is get people to shift those phases later in life. So trying to, you know, envision yourself being in that go-go phase, you know, and, and, Short of a medical emergency, maybe into your 80s or you know into your 90s, uh, and maybe trying to think of the no go, taking that off the, off the off the radar screen. So, you know, as you think about all these different things, obviously there's a financial components, there's fitness components, um, and uh, they're they're all things that you can uh, work on. You know, slowly. You don't have to, like I said, you don't have to eat the apple all at once. Um, you can kind of take bites out of it. So, as we kind of think about you know living longer, better. And we kind of, you know, closing out today's segment. Um, Any final comments, tips, thoughts? Yeah, you know, you mentioned the, you know, no-go phase. Probably the most common thing I hear from working with older adults, and oftentimes I'm seeing them from an injury, is that if I knew I was going to live this long, I would have taken better care of myself. Mm. So if you are in that busier phase of life, um, making that time, you know, making that appointment for yourself, for your health, for your fitness, will pay off dividends that um, really start making a huge impact, not only in the short term, but you'll notice it in those slow-go phases of life. Uh, It allows you to enjoy that later part in your life a lot easier, and uh, I think we'd have a lot more older adults with less regrets if they did that earlier. It's funny. I was talking to a coworker, and you know, he's like, "What if you're 44 and you're already in the slow go, no go phase? Because <laughs> you're tied to the office chair or just in a car driving kids around." Um, and I think that's you know the motivator is to, to kind of get going uh, earlier, earlier. So um, for that that earlier generation, I know this is probably be a whole nother show, but you know, for the 40 something year old who's thinking, hey, "I got time," any uh, motivating tips to not push it off any longer? Yeah, absolutely. You know, just make that time for yourself. Um, that it, it will not only have short-term impacts, but you're going to notice that you, things go very, very quickly in the 30s and the 40s in two different directions. 
One, you'll see people that are just doing amazing. They're still playing in their softball leagues. They're still able to be uh, that active uh, parent. And then you'll look around at some peers who are the desk jockeys that aren't going around. Um, the f- 30s and 40s, I think, are a critical time. Not only to set that, that habit, but also physiologically, your bodies can go through some pretty abrupt changes. Um, and although you can recover that into the 60s and 70s beyond, it's a lot harder. So um, if you're in that 30, 40 phase, don't wait. Get at this now. Yeah. Now, one last story. I know you've talked about you know someone who's traveling five days a week for work, says, I never have time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's not always about the number of time. It's about the quality. Exactly. Uh, you've shared some stories where you know people in just two or three days a week were able to make some, some sizable gaps. So if you're that 30, 40s, you know, you don't have all the time in the world. Is it still that 150 minutes or what's your, at a minimum, try to do this amount every week? Right. So based on that study I was mentioning, um, if you're only able to do one thing and you don't have a lot of time, you can't get that 150. It just, you can't fit it that in your life. Go for the two days a week resistance training. Uh, a very quick example, there was a very busy physician that we were working with. He only was getting one hour of exercise in on the weekends and there was nothing he could do during the week. So I asked him, I said, can you give me 15 minutes two days a week? He said, yes. So I said, great. Uh, When can you do that? I'll wake up 15 minutes early on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I said, great. I want you to pick three exercises you can do in your basement. Every one of those, each one of those three exercises, set a timer for five minutes. Get as many reps as you can on lunges in five minutes, as many reps as you can in your push-ups, many reps as you can in your rows. Count how many reps you got, and then each workout, try to get a little bit more. He got in great, great shape. Was it optimal? No, it was better than nothing. But just in a grand total of an hour and a half a week, he did make substantial changes in his health. So although we should aspire for more down the road, uh, don't forget that if you only have 15 minutes, uh, we can still figure out how to make useful time um, that will improve your health. Uh, Is it ideal according to the World Health Organization? No, but it is getting back to our BTN better than nothing. Now, Mike, you're a wealth of knowledge. I know you have a lot of uh, articles and books you've written. If someone, you know, I wanted to learn more, where, where do they go to kind of learn more from the brain of Mike? <laughs> the best place to go is spectrumfit.net. Uh, that's where I have a lot of my articles written. Uh, that's where I have uh, some books that you can uh, get access to, uh, some videos there. Um, so I would say of all the places, that's probably the best place to go. Great. Excellent. Well, Mike, as always, it's a pleasure talking. It inspires me to get healthier and do more. Um, and uh, thanks for being a guest. Yeah, really you're appreciate welcome. It. Yeah, thanks for having me. Look forward to being on in the future. Excellent. All right. Thanks for, uh, thanks for tuning in, everybody. Now, I hope you can apply some of what you heard today to improve your relationship with money. And thanks again for listening. Until next time, I'm Great Points with Matt Schroeder. Great Points is hosted by Matt Schroeder. Great Point Wealth Advisors is a registered investment advisory firm regulated by the Securities and Exchange Commission in accordance and compliance with the securities laws and regulations. Great Point Wealth Advisors does not render or offer to render personalized investment or tax advice through Great Points. The information provided is for informational purposes only and does not constitute financial, tax, investment, or legal advice.